Friedrich Bonhoeffer was born on February 4, 1906, in Breslau, Germany. Dietrich had a twin sister named Sabine and six other siblings. When he was six years old, his family moved to Berlin. Dietrich was visiting a village fair when he heard that Germany had declared war on Russia. At first, Dietrich was excited about the war, but when his older brother Walter joined the army and died two weeks later, he learned that war was not something to celebrate. Dietrich learned that Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Germany, had abdicated the throne. The war was lost, and Germany was humiliated. On Dietrich's 14th birthday, he decided to tell his family that he wanted to become a theologian. And then when Dietrich was 17 in 1923, he left to study at Tübingen University. He was there for two years and lived with his grandmother, Clara Bonhoeffer. He studied at the University of Berlin with renowned theologians. But his favorite theologian was a Swiss named Karl Barth. Barth brought all theological discussions back to the person of Jesus Christ. Dietrich went to the United States to study at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. In America, he saw something he had never seen in Germany. It was segregation between Negro and white races. He also fell in love with Negro spiritual music and brought home an extensive collection of records. When he arrived back in Berlin, Dietrich was ordained a pastor in 1931 at age 25. He was amazed at how much Germany had changed. An upstart political party called the Nazis was taking over Germany. Something sinister seemed to be happening to Germany. The Nazis hated the Jews and were actively persecuting them and reviling them in public. Bonhoeffer felt a need to alert the Germans. Then, an opportunity came to speak at the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church on Reformation Sunday, November 6, 1932. He reminded the congregation to live up to their Lutheran convictions and support their persecuted brethren, the Jews. This sermon was not popular and many walked out. The months following were filled with political wrangling. Hitler, the leader of the Nazi party, wore down 80-year-old President Paul von Hindenburg. Then, on January 30th, 1933, Hindenburg finally appointed Hitler to be chancellor of a coalition government. Without a majority vote, an Austrian criminal had become the most powerful man in Germany. One of the new measures passed was a law known as the Aryan Paragraph. The law forbade Jews to work in civil government. Jews were stripped of their civil rights. The German church had deemed the Bible too Jewish. The Nazis declared all references to Jews must be removed. Jesus was declared our greatest Aryan hero. The fact that he was Jewish was completely ignored. Dietrich heard of pastors who had been jailed for resisting the laws against the Jews. One of his friends, Martin Niemöller, was arrested repeatedly between 1934 and 1937 for preaching against state control of churches. In May 1934, a group of committed Christians met in Barnum and formed the Confessing Church. The Confessing Church was a group of true believers who wanted to uphold the Word of God. By 1935, a seminary to train the pastors for the Confessing Church was formed. Dietrich was elected as the director of the seminary, which he hoped could survive undetected in the town of Finkenwalde, Prussia. At Finkenwalde, Dietrich taught the theology students how to love God, the church, and be true pastors to the flock. The students had a strict routine, learning to discipline themselves to listen to God. At Finkenwald, Dietrich made two close friends, 
One was Eberhard Bedke, and the other person was a grandmother with a large estate named Ruth von Kreitzeretza. Martin Niebuhler was arrested again and more permanently this time on July 1st, 1937. About a month after that, Finkenwald Seminary was closed by the Gestapo. It had been open for two years and had ordained six graduating classes. In March 1938, Nazis marched into Austria and took over the country in a bloodless coup called the Onslaught. Hitler decided he wanted all Protestant pastors to swear a personal oath of allegiance to him alone. Dietrich, who was now 32, would not take the oath. On September 9th of 38, Dietrich took Sabina and her Jewish husband Gerhard across the Swiss border. They then traveled on and then to England. A month later, the borders were closed to the Jews forever. Germany then proceeded to attack the lowlands, Denmark, Norway, and France. World War II had begun. In order to avoid being conscripted into the army, Bonhoeffer began work as an agent for military intelligence, or the Abwehr. The chief of the Abwehr was Admiral William Canaris. His second in command was General Hans Oster. The Abwehr was against the Nazis, but in order to avoid suspicion, it had to look like it was working with the corrupt government. Hans de Nagne, Dietrich's brother-in-law, was already a member. Hans believed that Dietrich could use his ecumenical contacts to help the struggle between the Nazis. Germany began to experience its first signs of defeat when they were forced to surrender outside of Stalingrad, Russia. Signs that the war had escalated came with the December 7th Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The United States were now in the war. Dietrich was convinced it was only a matter of time before the Germans lost the war. Dietrich visited Ruth in Prussia. He was renewed with her 18-year-old granddaughter, Maria. Her father had just been killed in action and would lose her brother two months later. Naturally, she turned to Dietrich for consolation. Dietrich, 36, and Maria, 18, strong attraction formed between them. They began a lengthy correspondence. He proposed and she accepted. On April 5th, 1943, the Gestapo came to his parents' home in Grunwald. He was arrested and taken to the Tangle prison. He devised a plan to keep himself focused on God and others. Bonhoeffer was held at Tangle prison for 18 months before he was transferred. At the Gestapo prison, Dietrich saw more prisoners than he had seen at Tangle. He recognized Admiral Canaris and General Oster. He also saw his brother-in-law, Hans de Nagne. The day after a long Allied bombing attack, Dietrich turned 39. Early in 1945, Dietrich was transported to Buchenwald, a concentration camp. On April 3rd, along with 15 other men, Dietrich was marched into a truck bound for Flossenburg camp. The van had mechanical difficulties, and they had several stops in makeshift prisons throughout Bavaria. On April 8th, Quasimodo Sunday, less than 24 hours before he left this world, Bonhoeffer performed the offices of a pastor. In the bright Schomburg classroom that was their cell, he held a small service. No sooner had he finished speaking than two evil-looking men came in and ordered Prisoner Bonhoeffer, get ready to come with us. Everyone knew what that meant. The next day, April 9th, 1945, two years and four days after his arrest, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was marched out of his cell for the last time. As the guilty verdict was read and their death sentences handed down, 
Dietrich knelt in prayer and then he was hanged. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act.